Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask you that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. Well, it's a bit of a complicated statement there or, or passage isn't it it's just in 13 verses paul used just two sentences uh, maybe not um not uh, good for grammar um but um paul loves to get really involved in these things so it takes a little bit of unpacking but we're not going to go through in every detail and every word here this morning but i want to ask why did paul write that passage why did he write it because he begins um and then he breaks off again. In verse 1, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. And then he kind of breaks off until he gets down, actually, to verse 14, is when he comes back to where he started. And if you sometimes start saying something and then get distracted and digress and then um, then come back. Um, the, the other night, the uh, Coast Grove Trailblazers were playing Speak for a Minute. And, um, and you're not allowed to hesitate or repeat or digress from your subject but Paul has no problem in digressing from uh, from what he's setting out to say and he's about to write a prayer for the Ephesians and uh, this is what he, how he starts in verse 1 he's about to to pray for them and then he stops he's just called himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ but how do his readers react to that will it discourage them no, they, you can imagine him them saying to him, Paul, you've told us the blessing of the Christian life, but now you're suffering. How can that be? Is the Christian faith a lost cause? Does it just not work? Doesn't Christ know how to save you from that suffering? Well, Paul doesn't want them to be discouraged by his sufferings. Maybe sometimes we, we are. Do you sometimes have a problem with suffering? And maybe in theory we say, oh, well, you obviously know Christians to suffer. But when it actually comes to it and you suffer, do you think it's a strange thing? Do you begin to doubt, well, why is the Lord letting this happen to me? Do you begin to get impatient with the Lord when that happens? Well, Paul doesn't want us to be discouraged by our sufferings or the Ephesians to be discouraged by the fact that he is suffering. And what he wants to, them to do is to glory in those sufferings rejoice in the sufferings that paul has for them well, that's pretty strange isn't it why does he want them to do that how does he want them to see his sufferings he says my sufferings are for you i'm the prisoner of jesus christ for you three times he uses that those two words for you in this passage it's for you this is what I'm, I'm going through this 
for you, for your sake, for your blessing, that you might enjoy your place in the glorious plan of God. And so he, he talks about God's plan. Now, Paul was given a mission to preach the gospel to the Gentiles because God had a plan and was including them in his plan, a glorious plan. And that was why he was suffering in the, in, in the pursuance of that plan of God, to bring these people into the plan of God. And so really verses 2 through to verse 12 are about that plan. And what is God's plan? What is the central plan of the universe? What's God really about? What's the plan above all plans in the world? There's governments and nations have their various plans. We have our different plans, don't we? What is God's plan? What is he doing? What is he focusing on? Where is history leading to? God's plan is the church. Is the redemption of his people from every part of the world for every tribe and tongue and people and nation not just the jews the gentiles too this is what he calls in verse 11 the eternal purpose which he accomplished in christ jesus our lord or literally made in christ jesus our lord it's all founded upon jesus and what he had come to do he's the key to the whole plan so let's just think about that for a few moments and then see how paul sort of comes back to the application of it first thing is god's plan revealed now sometimes you get some great media publicity about some the announcement of a new product coming on the market it may be apple with their latest iphone or maybe the unveiling of some new mod car model. And uh, there you've got some great audience seated in the auditorium, uh, wondering what's coming up, excited, expectant, um, wondering uh, just what, uh, what they're going to be seeing and hearing about. Maybe it's a new car, there's a big curtain that conceals it. And uh, finally the, the managing director comes onto the stage, he has a few words of introduction, and then the moment arrives and the curtain is, um, is pulled back or he gets his iPhone out and, um, and uh, there's a great display up on the screen in the back showing what it can do. The product, the new product has been revealed. It's been in the planning for a long time and it's been kept secret for all that time. But now the moment of revelation takes place. And a big part of God's plan has been hidden for many years. Paul calls it the mystery. Uh, there in verse 3 talks about the mystery and this mystery means it's something that has been hidden but has now been revealed something we couldn't have known by ourselves but god has now seen fit to, to reveal it and paul says it's now been revealed the great unveiling has taken place the great announcement has taken place and it's been revealed to paul and to the other apostles and to the new testament prophets by the holy spirit and what is that? What is that mystery that's been revealed? Well, verse 6 says this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. It is that the Gentiles have been accepted on equal terms with the Jews. Paul had been writing about that in the previous chapters, but now he's highlighting how wonderful and how revolutionary this thing is up till now the jews have been the exclusive privileged people of god for centuries god had dealt with the jews and and the other nations had kind of been left out and the jews had felt very proud of their privileges and they treated the gentiles with disdain as they even called them dogs but now they're being accepted on equal terms those gentiles are being brought in and joined to the jews on equal terms the gospel is not just ex for, exclusive for the Jews, it's for all people. It brings us all into these privileges. It brings us all to the same level, first of all, because the gospel convicts us all of sin and failure, whether Jew or Gentile. It convicts us all that we all fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned against God. We're all guilty. We're all in need, whoever we are. And it brings us to the only answer 
the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Christ we all need. This is um, what we read in chapter 2 of Ephesians in verse 16. That God might reconcile them both to God in one body. That Christ rather might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. Therefore putting to death the enmity. It's through the cross that he brings Jew and Gentile into a right relationship with God. The Jew needs the cross, the Gentile needs the cross. We're brought to the same point. We're all sinners, we all need the cross. And it brings us to the same blessings. The Gentiles are not second-class citizens in the kingdom of heaven, but they are now fellow heirs. That we inherit the same blessings that the Jews have. We inherit a place in, amongst God's people. We inherit a place in God's kingdom that we are the same body, the one church of Jesus Christ, and that we share in his promise in, the gospel, in Christ through the gospel. We share in the same promise of having the Holy Spirit living in us, the same promise of the resurrection to eternal life. All the blessings and privileges are given to us as well as to them. There were hints and pointers in the Old Testament but now, Paul says, has been fully revealed. It's been kept secret till now, but the great unveiling has taken place. The Gentiles are in on equal terms. The gospel was for all nations. And Paul is saying to these Ephesians, yes, it's for you. And that's what he's been really been saying in the previous two chapters as well. It's for you. And I was sent to preach the gospel to you. Verse 2 is another one of those that uh, speaks about for you. So the second thing, the first thing is God's plan has been revealed, but God's plan administered in verses 7 and 8. How would God's plan come to fruition? How would the people from all nations be brought into that one body and share in the blessings of Christ? Well, of course, by the preaching of the gospel. And Paul says he'd been chosen and called to spearhead the mission to the Gentiles. Is in verse 7, he just mentions the gospel there in verse 6. In verse 7, he says, of which I became a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He is amazed that God had chosen him. It is God's grace that had chosen him. It was not his deserving. It was not because he was something special. But God, in his grace, in his favor, in his mercy, made him a preacher of the gospel by his power. Remember how Paul was utterly against the church. He was persecuting Christians. He wanted Christianity stamped out from the, the world. He put people in prison. He had them put to death. But the power of God met with him. On that road we mass, Christ met with him there and changed his life. And he was called to go and preach Christ to the Gentiles. And that power enabled him to go out with the gospel and to preach the gospel of Christ. And he's absolutely amazed. He says, I'm the less than the least of all the saints. You know, we sometimes praise Paul up and think what a wonderful man he was. But how did he regard himself with such humility, less than the least of all the saints, the most unworthy of all people, that I should have the privilege of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles? And what did he preach? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Got a feeling I might have used this illustration not long ago, but forgive me if I did. But I um, heard recently of a man when he was a boy that uh, his, his mum called him and said, uh, I want you to go over there because um, I want you to see something. And as he looked, he saw a car at his uncle's farm just nearby. And uh, his uncle and aunt were there. And there was somebody else there as well. I think his dad was there as well. And they were looking in the boot of a car. And uh, they're, they're all looking very interested and intrigued with what was in this boot of this car. So he thought, well, I'm going to have a look and see what's in the boot of the car. And when he got there, what he saw inside was all muddy and dirty, but it was treasure. It was what we now call the Hoxon Hoard, a treasure trove that uh, this chap had dug up, as, uh, presumably on this man's uncle's farm, 
and um, and found an amazing, a boot full of treasure that is now in the British Museum. And well, how exciting it must have been to see that treasure. Absolutely amazing, worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. But what greater riches there are in Christ. Paul had something much better to tell people about, not just treasure dug up out of a field, but the, the unsearchable riches of Christ, the overflowing mercy and love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal blessings that he brings, the blessings of his salvation, of being forgiven, of being justified, of new life in the Holy Spirit, of all sorts of things, a reconciliation with God, the hope of heaven, We've been thinking of the I Ams over recent Sunday mornings and, and they just speak to us of the unsearchable riches of Christ, the bread of life, the light of the world, the, the resurrection and the life and so on. They just speak of how wonderful Christ is. And Paul said, I was given the privilege of preaching that to you. What news? Now, we have so much bad news on the television, don't we? So it's the news on each day and it's uh, sadly... A bit depressing, isn't it? And uh, worrying, and not just at the moment, but uh, usually the news is bad. But, Jesus, but Paul had the privilege of preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is the greatest thing. This is something worth speaking about. It's bringing hope to the nations, preaching to people lost in darkness, bringing people back to God, back to life. What an amazing thing. Of course, it wasn't just Paul, but he was chosen by God to open up the nations and to trailblaze the way for others to bring that glorious news to others. That they might be brought in. And that they might have a place in God's plan, a place in God's church. So the God's plan revealed, God's plan administered through the preaching of the gospel the unsearchable riches of Christ, and God's plan displayed. What will be the outcome of this preaching? Be the building of the church. That, uh, in our village, um, many people have been watching a house going up just on the corner of uh, Meeting Lane and the little footpath there. An old bungalow was torn down and saw the land getting prepared and the foundations laid. We're all wondering what kind of house is this going to be? And uh, then we watched as week by week we saw progress as bricks and blocks were laid and roof trusses put on and so on. And a lovely house was coming into view. And so as the gospel is preached, as sinners from every nation are saved and brought in, Jew and Gentile brought together into one body, so bit by bit, the glorious building of the church is coming into view. The kingdom of Christ extending across the world, not just in our country, but across Asia and Africa and America and wherever, it may, wherever people are. There's the gospel spreading out. There are people are being brought in. There the kingdom of Christ is growing. As Isaiah puts it, the mountain of the Lord is exalted above all the mountains. We just read uh, that verse from Isaiah chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. And so he's talking in using symbolic language, his pitch language of people coming uh, to, uh, to, to, the, in, to, to the knowledge of the Lord, to be part of the church, and the church being built as a great edifice, a wonderful building of God. This is the church of redeemed people, called out of the world, built together. It's a reuniting of divided mankind from every nation. I was reading on the calendar the other day of someone who said, we just need a charismatic person who could bring everybody together. Whereas well, the Lord Jesus Christ who brings people together from all divided backgrounds. Jew and Arab come together in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
black and white come together in the Lord Jesus Christ, rich and poor. He brings people from every, from all the divisions and the and, and, and the breaches of, of society, he brings them together into one. This is that work of building the church. It's this church that God is busy building, a church made up of countless people redeemed by Christ. This is God's eternal purpose. This is God's wonderful plan worked out in his amazing wisdom. And so Paul says in verse 10, this is what he's aiming for, to the, int uh, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The principalities and powers are looking on and seeing what God is doing. Now, some people think the principalities and powers here are evil powers. Um, in chapter 6 and verse 12, we read of principalities and powers in the heavenly place, or spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, and there are powers and rulers and so on there in chapter 6, and they're evil powers. And despite their best efforts, they've not been able to stop God. God is building this church regardless. But I rather think the principalities and powers here are good powers, the angels who are looking on in wonder and amazement, admiring what God is doing as he builds his church against all the odds, as he takes helpless, guilty, filthy sinners and makes them his own, as he brings them together into one, as he blesses them with the blessings of salvation. At such a cost to God, working in such an amazing way with tremendous wisdom, building this church and the angels are looking on and wondering adoring as they see the church coming together so god is creating his church for his glory this is where history is leading this is god's great plan this is god's great task he's revealed it that he's bringing the gentiles in as well as the jews making them on equal footing paul preached it that it might come to pass and God is doing this great work displaying his glory in the building of the church the practical implication is in verse 12 that in Christ we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him and the church is the place as the, as the people that have a access to God there are people now in fellowship with God Sinners can now be at one with God. We can draw near to the Holy One. Sinners can come in the presence of God. We can have access with confidence. God is redeeming sinners. That they might be his people, sharing fellowship with him. As we sing at Christmas time, peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconcile. And Paul says, you Ephesians, you Gentiles in Ephesus, you are a part of God's plan because God has sent me to preach the gospel to you. I am preaching the gospel that you might have a part in this plan, that you might be part of that glorious church, the people of God, with, in fellowship with God. It's for you. And it's for you that I am suffering. And so he says in verse 13, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. I don't want you to be discouraged because I'm in prison. I don't want you to be disheartened because I'm suffering. I don't want you to be ashamed of my suffering. I don't want you to think that because I'm suffering, the cause is lost. No, I can't have a privilege to be suffering. Well, first of all, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm not a prisoner of the Romans. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for his sake, and I glory in serving him. He was suffering simply because he was being faithful to his calling to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. It was that that led to his suffering. He says, I'm here in prison for you because I'm about this tremendous task of bringing the Gentiles into the church. I'm willing to suffer for that because the task is so great and so glorious. I'm willing to suffer to bring to you the unsearchable riches of Christ. Christ is worth it. His gospel is worth it. This suffering is not for you to be ashamed of. It's your glory. Yeah, glory in the fact 
but there's such a wonderful gospel that Paul is prepared to go to prison to bring it to them. So Paul wasn't phased by suffering for Christ. He didn't moan and complain. He just recognised the glorious task he was involved in. He was contributing to God's plan. And it was worth it. The gospel is worth the toil and the pain, the shame and the suffering. And I wonder whether we share the same excitement that Paul had over God's plan. Do we share the same excitement about the building of the church, about sinners from every nation coming to Christ, about the angels looking on with adoring wonder as they see the church being built? Do we see this as something that is our priority as well as God's priority? Is it something that we consider worth paying a price for as we're involved in that work of building the church, as we're involved in some way or other in spreading the gospel do we consider this as something that is worth us making sacrifices for is it something worth us making an effort at is reaching the lost important to us is god's vision our vision too you know sometimes it does mean suffering sometimes it does mean Paying a cost. Sometimes it does mean just sacrifice and giving up things. Is it worth it? It was worth it for Paul. Paul was willing to lose his freedom for this. He was willing to pay any cost to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to build God's church. Are we willing to suffer for that? Are we willing just to suffer, just to live for Christ, just to let our light shine, to live a godly life? Isn't this worth spending our lives for? As Paul says in Philippians 1, 21, but to me, to live is Christ. And I don't mind what happens, he says, as long as Christ is there, that's what really counts. You ever sometimes feel hesitant about your faith, wondering you know, when maybe you are called to suffer, when you are called to pay a cost, you think, well, is it really worth it? Could I be doing something better? Could I be doing something more, more enjoyable? But the gospel's worth the price. Paul wasn't afraid to suffer to bring that gospel to others. He wasn't afraid to suffer for Christ's name. And with what joy so many martyrs have gone to their deaths, holding the gospel to the end because they consider it so much so worth it. The riches of Christ were too precious for them to let go of. I know. Forgive me if I refer to the, those who burnt at the stake too often. But let me just tell you of Thomas Hawkes, who died at the stake in 1555. He said, if I had a hundred bodies, I would suffer them all to be torn in pieces, rather than I will abjure and recant. I'm not going to give up my faith. Even if I had a hundred bodies to be torn in pieces, I still wouldn't give up my faith. Too precious. The gospel is too precious to me. He agreed with his friends uh, beforehand that um, if the pains of being burned at the stake were bearable, that he would hold up his hands towards heaven before he died as a signal. And when he was finally brought to the stake, uh, that uh, the, 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 the fire blazed all around him and he was speaking, but no one could hear him speak because the flames are so, so loud. And, uh, but he was in the fire for a long time. And he was very still and people thought he was dead. And just then, Thomas, remembering the promise he had made to his friends, raised both his hands, still burning with flames, raised them high above his head. And as if as in, in an ecstasy of joy, he clapped them together three times. Is he ashamed to suffer for Christ? Joy in the midst of the flames cannot possibly be because the gospel was so valuable to him to hold on to and to preach. John Huss has said that he was willing to die because he was preaching the gospel to save sinners. He was concerned about people's salvation and he would not leave that gospel. He would not uh, depart from that gospel, even if it meant being burned at the stake for it. 
because this is something so precious. The unsearchable riches of Christ are so precious. The plan of God is so glorious. And this is something we're privileged to be involved in. And may we count it a great honour to serve Christ, even if it means sacrifice and toil and suffering for him. We're part of building that house in God's grace. And may we put our hand to the work. I'm going just to open the meeting now just to allow two or three people just to pray. I'm going to pray in response uh, to, to that and to um, ask the Lord to bring it to our hearts.